I make it 10 o'clock, we will now start today's webinar. Welcome everybody to today's webinar on death in prison custody inquests, where today we are looking at specific case studies. I'm Elizabeth Wallace, for anyone who doesn't know me. I am a senior associate based in our Manchester office. I'm also joined by David Crone, who is a senior associate in our Liverpool office and Charlotte Brocklehurst, who is an associate in our Manchester office. And we all deal with death in prison custody inquests. Before we actually start the webinar, just a few points on housekeeping. Please note that your microphones are muted and cameras are automatically switched off. The reason for this is that there are a number of you attending today's webinar. The session is being recorded and by joining today's webinar, you are consenting to being recorded. The PowerPoint slides will be sent out after today's webinar. If you have any questions or comments, please do submit these via the chat box in Teams. Uh, we won't be using the raised hand facility. And as I said before, you are muted and cameras are off for today's webinar. We will then answer any questions that you have after each case study. So there will be plenty of opportunities for questions. If you are having problems with your sound, please do try logging off and rejoining the Teams link. Also check for any device settings that you have. So if you're having problems hearing the presentation, please ensure that you are disconnected from any monitors um, connecting to your computer or laptop. Please also check your settings for your sound um, check it's on the correct playback device, whether that be headphones or laptops. Your feedback is really important to us um, because we use your feedback for looking at topics for future webinars. So if you have any feedback or any ideas for future webinars, please do let us know in the feedback form, which will be provided to you after today's webinar. So in today's webinar, we will be covering two case studies. The first case study concerns Jay Green and the second case study concerns Ali Shah. So the case studies in this webinar are based on inquests that our team have dealt with and highlight key themes or issues for healthcare that we tend to see um, at death in prison custody inquests. The first case study concerning Jay Green concerns a death from a naturally occurring condition. And the second case study concerning Ali Shah um, is a wholly unnatural um, cause of death. So you can see the different types of deaths or scenarios that you might come across in the coroner's court. This webinar follows on from our earlier webinar on giving evidence at death in prison custody inquest. So it does assume a basic understanding of inquests and the relevant terminology. So that's including PFD, prevention of future deaths, record of inquest and conclusion. It's also, it also assumes an understanding of some prison terminology. So that includes ACT, assessment, care and custody and teamwork, segregation unit, DART, drug and recovery team, PSI, prison service instruction, and the PPO, Prisons and Probation Ombudsman. As a reminder, if you have any questions or observations to make during the webinar, please do put them in the comments or chat section in Teams, and we will revisit them when we are dealing with questions after each case study. So I will now hand over to Charlie, who will present the first case study. Thanks, Lizzie. OK, so our first case study um, is in relation to Jay Green. So Jay Green was an inmate at HMP Crossroads with a previous medical history of COPD and substance misuse. In March 2022, he began to experience chest pain and was due to undergo an ECG as an outpatient at hospital. But there was no fixed date for this. On the 12th of June 2022, Jay was transferred from HMP Crossroads to HMP Junction. When he was transferred, Jay told a nurse that he was due to undergo an ECG due to his symptoms of chest pain. The nurse noted this, but took no further action. On the 30th of June 2022, a clinical letter was received from the hospital at HMP Crossroads, 
which was scanned into Jay's System 1 records outlining abnormal blood test results, indicating that he required a hospital admission. No further action was taken to share this information with the healthcare team at HMP Junction. Jay received an appointment to undergo an ECG at Pathways Hospital on the 3rd of July 2022. On the day of his appointment, prison officers were busy with emergencies and Jay could not be escorted to hospital, so he missed his appointment. On 7th of September 2022, a prison officer radioed healthcare staff to request a medical emergency code blue as Jay was vomiting and had diarrhoea. Jay was reviewed by a nurse who confirmed that his vital signs were within normal range. A medical emergency code was not necessary. The next day, a prison officer radioed healthcare staff again with a medical emergency code blue as Jay had collapsed. A prison paramedic attended to Jay, completed another set of observations and found his blood glucose level had increased but did not undertake an ECG. Jay was advised to see healthcare staff if his symptoms worsened. Later that day, at approximately 2.30pm, Jay had collapsed again and was reviewed by the paramedic who noted his observations. Sorry, things are popping up now on my screen. Uh, observations were getting worse. He had increased difficulty breathing and his oxygen saturations were lower. The paramedic assessed that Jay needed to go to hospital urgently and told a prison manager that an ambulance should be called. At 5.30 p.m., a non-urgent ambulance was called. At 6 p.m., the paramedic completed an ECG which showed that Jay had possible pericardial effusion. The ambulance service were contacted four more times and at 9.15 p.m. the control room requested an emergency ambulance. The ambulance arrived at 9.30 p.m. and Jay was transferred to hospital. Hospital staff tried to resuscitate him. They were unable to do so and Jay died at 11.30 p.m. A post-mortem found Jay had died as a result of 1A cardiac arrest, 1B metabolic acidosis and 1C diarrhoea and vomiting. So I'll now hand back to Lizzie to discuss the issues identified in this case. Thanks very much, Charlie. I think we've had a couple of comments um, that some of the attendees can't see the slide. So what I will do is I'm going to. Um, yes, so Diane has suggested if, if those who can't see the slides, if they can try leaving um, the Teams link and then rejoining, um, that's probably the best and we'll, we'll continue on um, in the meantime. So what were the issues in relation to the healthcare provision in this particular case? What I will do is I will provide you all with a couple of minutes um, just to think about what issues that you've heard and if you can identify any issues that you've found um, and include them in, your, in the comments box, that'd be really helpful. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes for that. Could an ECG have been performed earlier? Absolutely. That is definitely one of the issues in this case. Can anybody think of any other issues that they have spotted? Delay in attending outpatients. Yep, no clinical oversight during this period. Delay in ambulance response. Those are all correct. Physical health appointment not followed up. Absolutely. Lack of recognition of urgency. Yeah, I think you guys are absolutely on track. No urgent ambulance called. Um, good question. News scores taken. Um, in this case, based on the facts, 
we don't appear to have much in the way of new scores. So, in terms of the issues that were identified, so yes, the nurse failed to take further action at the reception screen when Jay reported that he was meant to undergo an ECG due to his symptoms of chest pain. Further, a clinical letter was scanned into Jay's System 1 records, but this was not sh shared directly with the healthcare team at HMP Junction. So there was an issue with um, communication there. Jay could not have been um, escorted to hospital for his appointment, and that was due to emergencies um, that were taking place at the prison, um, and he missed his medical appointment. There was also a failure to complete an ECG promptly following his first unexplained collapse. This may have meant a delay in diagnosing the possible cause of Jay's collapse and in turn may have led to a delay in calling an ambulance. There was also a lack of clarity about whether an emergency ambulance was required and that was something that was picked up. The PSI on medical emergency response code says that a emergency code should only be called in a medical emergency. Now, in on one occasion um, during Jay's treatment, a code was called by prison staff when it wasn't required. Um, obviously, this can have an effect on resources within the healthcare team. So it's important that the correct emergency codes are called. So just in summary, in terms of the issues in this case, um, a failure to action matters following a reception screen is something that we do seem to see a lot um, at Inquest, whether that is failure to um, provide follow up or referrals to perhaps see the GP or the mental health team. Issues with communication um, to a receiving prison following a prison tra prisoner transfer is also something we see a lot. So. That's all to do with continuity of care, ensuring that that prisoner um, is receiving um, care and any outstanding appointments or treatment is provided at the receiving prison. Missed appointments due to problems with prison escorts is something we do see a lot. And you can imagine perhaps one appointment missed may not be a massive issue. Um, however, if it is on multiple occasions, a condition which on the face of it um, is not serious can subsequently become more serious. Failure to complete key clinical investigations such as news, observations or an ECG in this case is also something that we see at Inquest. Issues with emergency ambulances and when they should be called due to lack of clarity as to the urgency of a request, that is something that we also see a lot and you can imagine the repercussions of that um, where an ambulance is called but there's a delay in them attending. Problems with emergency codes, um, I would say this is probably the most common issue that I tend to see at death and prison custody inquests. Um, prison staff often um, don't, don't call emergency codes whether that be code red or code blue and therefore there's a misunderstanding or lack of communication with healthcare as to the urgency of the situation. So those are the types of issues um, that we see regularly at death and prison custody inquests and are highlight highlighted in this particular case study. So in terms of the recommendations for the head of healthcare, so bearing in mind the issues um, that have been flagged in this particular case, the PPO um, provided a number of recommendations for the head of health health care. And just by way of reminder for anybody who wasn't at our first webinar, um, what the coroner will usually do is ask for the head of health care to attend the inquest to give evidence on what's called lesson learning. So that to ensure that if there have been any issues with the health care provided, that the head of health care can provide reassurance to the coroner and the family of the deceased that lessons have been learned. And the reason why this evidence is so important is because if the coroner deems that there hasn't been lesson learning that's taken place and there's still a risk to, um, to future patients or prisoners, then the coroner can issue what's called a prevention future deaths report to the organisation which is able to take action, in this case, healthcare. 
So in Jay's correct case, the recommendations that the PPO um, set out were as follows. So the head of healthcare should ensure that, firstly, outstanding clinical investigations are reviewed and progressed at the reception screen. Secondly, clinical letters scanned onto system one following a prisoner transfer are notified to the receiving prison. Thirdly, an ECG is undertaken promptly if a prisoner collapses without clear explanation, regardless of their physical presentation. Fourthly, healthcare staff must make it clear to prison staff if an emergency ambulance is required and record that they have done so, so by way of record keeping. The local medical emergency protocol needs to make it clear how information about the prisoner's condition will be communicated to, to the ambulance service and the protocol is agreed with the local ambulance trust. So how might we address this in terms of lesson learning evidence for the inquest? So what we would usually advise is for the head of healthcare to provide a statement to the coroner ahead of the inquest specifically addressing the lesson learning and the recommendations in the PPO report. So in this case, how might we address those recommendations? Well, firstly, there's learning in relation to the reception screen. So that learning could involve individual learning for the nurse involved in this particular case to ensure that they have personally reflected on what's happened. Secondly, the head of healthcare can complete regular audits of the reception um, health screen to make sure it is being completed in a timely manner and robustly ensuring that any follow up um, or further um, referrals take place. Thirdly, the head of healthcare can ensure that there is refresher training to all those members of staff who complete the health reception screen. Clinic letters. So in this case, obviously, we heard that there was an issue with a clinic letter not getting um, notified to the receiving prison that Jay went to. So what the head of healthcare can do is ensure that any follow up clinic letters that are uploaded on system one follow a telephone call or an email that goes to the receiving prison. So they know that that letter is actually on the system so they can review it. Um, I also had an inquest where the head of healthcare was exploring whether there was an ability to put a flag on the system one record so that will alert the um, receiving prison to the fact that there is new correspondence on the system one record. ECG so in this case an um, ECG was not completed following Jay's initial collapse when it should have been so the learning from this case would be that further training is required of staff specifically in relation to when to complete ECGs and it would also be helpful for the head of healthcare to circulate the NICE guidance on the management of transient loss of consciousness just to check that staff are fully aware of what the guidance is. Emergency ambulances so as I said before, there was some confusion in this case as to whether an emergency ambulance was required. So in terms of the learning from this incident, it'd be really helpful for the head of healthcare to share the learning with the wider team to ensure that it's highlighted to staff that clear communication is really very important. I recall in this particular case as well, part of the issue for the coroner was the fact that there was a lack of notes and records in relation to what communication was made about the status of the ambulance. Because of the fact that it wasn't written down and it wasn't clear that it was supposed to be an urgent um, emergency ambulance, the coroner essentially said, basically it wasn't clear to prison staff that it was required urgently. It wasn't written down, it didn't happen, and that wasn't communicated. And that is the stance that coroners generally take in terms of evidence. If it's not written down, it didn't happen. Emergency codes. So it's really important in this particular case that the head of healthcare reviews the protocol for the summonsing of an emergency ambulance and ensure that this is fit for purpose and agreed with the prison and the ambulance trust. This was an issue in this case because unfortunately, which I think is is essentially a national problem. 
you often have healthcare staff who are on site um, with the patient providing treatment. And then you have a number of um, communication links through various prison staff until you reach the ambulance service. This obviously carries risk because along the way, any sort of information might be missed or filtered out. And therefore, it's really important that there is some sort of um, clear protocol about what the communication is. Ideally, missing out as many people as possible so healthcare are able to speak to the ambulance service as directly as they possibly can. Um, and that was definitely the learning in this particular case. So moving on to the inquest outcome for Jay's inquest. So as you'll recall, for a death in prison custody, it's mandatory um, for a coroner to sit with a jury. And so in terms of the outcome, it's the jury who provide the um, findings of fact and conclusion. So in this particular case, the jury recorded a recorded the following in box three of the record of inquest. And that's basically um, a section on the record of inquest document, which is the final document that the um, jury needs to complete at the end of an inquest. And the answer to the question is how, when and where and in what circumstances Jay came by his death. And in that box, the jury recalled the following. Jay Green died of natural causes. He died from cardiac arrest. We feel that the following matters had a bearing on his death. Firstly, an ECG should have been taken following his initial collapse. Secondly, there was inadequate communication between internal departments, which contributed to delays in getting appropriate treatment. And that is in reference to the breakdown in communication around the ambulance and when to transport into hospital. The jury recorded the following narrative conclusion in box four of the record of inquest. So in the coroner's court, you'll recall that you can either have a narrative conclusion or what's called a short form conclusion. In this case, it's a narrative conclusion and the jury record Jay Green died as a result of a cardiac arrest brought on by metabolic acidosis as a result of prolonged diarrhea and vomiting exacerbated by failings that caused inappropriate delay in him getting appropriate treatment. And I'm pleased to say on the basis of the lesson learning evidence that was provided by the head of healthcare and the reassurance that was provided to the coroner, the coroner was satisfied with the evidence that was provided and felt that a prevention of future deaths report or regulation 28 report was not provided in this particular case. So in terms of questions on case study one, what I will do is I will turn to um, the chat section to see if we have any particular questions in relation to case study one. Well, I think we've had quite a few uh, comments, haven't we? Um, let me see. Yeah, a few came in, Lizzie. Um, first one, um, presumably repeated failure to escort to appointment. Is that a breach of human rights? Well, I think in terms of death in prison custody inquest, they will automatically um, engage what's called Article 2 of the Human Rights Act, which is the right to life. Um, so essentially, there, there does need to be um, that the prisoner needs to be afforded the opportunity for the right to life. Um, so the Human Rights Act would feature um, in this case, as it does in in death and prison custody um, inquests, often on an automatic basis. OK, and another one, um, is there a financial penalty for failings? In the coroner's court, there isn't any financial penalty um, for failings, but in terms of the consequences of a um, critical conclusion at an inquest, there's a couple of things that could happen. So the family of Jay could think that they could bring a clinical negligence claim um, against the healthcare organisation. Um, so it could result in, in a claim following the inquest. Um, there could be referrals to the NMC. So if we think about the nurse who was in reception, doing the reception screen, the family or the coroner may feel that that is conduct that is um, worthy to be 
explored in more detail by the NMC. So those referrals could follow um, this inquest. Um, but in terms of financial penalties, there isn't any powers in the coroner's court for financial penalties. Um, so that, that doesn't feature here. OK, you've answered the next one because that was about NMC and HPCP referrals. Yeah. Um, is there data on avoidable unexpected deaths in custody? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think there is data. So the coroner statistics um, come out each year and they do include some data on deaths in prison custody. Um, and I'm trying to remember now actually what the figures were for the last statistics, which I think came out last year. And I think from off the top of my head, I think the number of um, unnatural deaths in prison have actually gone down. Um, but the number of natural deaths in prison are, are on the rise. And I suspect that is down to the fact that we do have an ageing population within the prison estate. Um, but I might have to come back to you, Gillian, because I'll need to go back and check the statistics myself. <laughs> OK, and then. Um, there seems to be it seems to be paramount that the assurances and lessons learned provided by head of healthcare are of utmost importance in the outcome of an inquest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, un unfortunately, things happen um, in terms of. Uh, Sometimes deaths occur and they are avoidable. Um, unfortunately, everyone's human. People make mistakes. But from the coroner and the family's point of view, the focus then needs to shift on to, well, what have we actually learned from this death to make sure that the risk of an occurrence like this happening again is minimised? And that's where the lesson learning evidence and assurance from the head of healthcare is so important. And it's worth um, just flagging that as well as the head of healthcare, so you don't think the focus is all just on healthcare. Um, the governor for the prison, um, usually the governor for safe of custody, will also be called by the coroner to give evidence on any lesson learning from a prison staff perspective. So you can imagine in Jay's case, um, if I was the coroner, I would want to hear a bit more about how um, prison staff are getting trained on emergency codes to make sure that they know when they're supposed to be doing them and understand what they mean. Um, I think there might have been a comment from someone earlier, which, um, which is absolutely right. This whole code red and code blue thing means nothing to the ambulance service. And that's where it's really important that that is literally just used as what it's supposed to be, which is just a call, isn't it, to get healthcare to attend with certain bits of equipment. But in terms of actual communication to the ambulance, we need to make sure that we're getting that important information about, um, you know, are they breathing? Are they conscious? All those sorts of in, important information that the ambulance service need to be able to categorise the call correctly. Um, so there's definitely a need for understanding amongst prison staff that, you know, what is the information that they need to be providing to the ambulance service? And that's why I've been to a number of inquests now where a lot of coroners have said, why can't healthcare just talk directly to the ambulance? But it's difficult because in the prison estate, you've got a communications room, which is which is run by prison staff. So I do think that's quite a difficult thing to resolve. And I don't think there's a quick answer to that. So I'd be interested to know if there are any heads of healthcare um, in this webinar, if anyone's managed to find a way around that, I'd be interested to know. Have we got any further questions? Let's see. I think we've got one more. Yeah. Um, how is the evidence that learning and improvements are embedded into practice? So, so that's. Yeah, we'd David, say you audits, answer it. We? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. it's audits, often. Audits, audits, yeah. Yeah. It can be hard to um, demonstrate, you know, whether something's been embedded in practice, but audits are the, are the best way of showing that. And also, if there's been any sort of training, sometimes we'll provide to the coroner a um, anonymised copy of the um, training training list, like checklist, to make sure that you know all the members of staff have actually attended this training, um, and any compliance figures that the head of healthcare might have. So, obviously, 
heads of healthcare will often have um, key performance indicators that they need to provide to NHS England and other bodies. That information could also be really helpful at an inquest. Let's see if we've got any other questions. Ah, so we do have a bit of information just about statistics. So the Prison Reform Trust, Bromley Briefings, Prison, Fact File 2023 has a huge amount of helpful information and data, including a section on safety in prisons, which includes deaths by natural causes, but may, may not have the level of detail. Um, that sounds really helpful. So that's something I'll, I'll certainly be having a look at after today's webinar. So if anybody is wanting to find out more about the statistics that have been gathered, um, the Prison Reform Trust data may also be of assistance. Yeah, we've also had a comment from um, uh, from one of the attendees about comms can put healthcare on the phone during a 999 call. Um, yes, I've heard of that at some prisons. Um, I've also heard at some prisons that unfortunately the signal's not great. Um, so they might be able to get on the phone, but whether they'll actually be able to speak um, to the ambulance, I'm not too sure, but it'd be interesting to see what other prisons are doing in that regard. Can families go back to see if recommendations have been implemented? So what tends to happen is when the evidence is provided to the coroner and the family at the inquest, and the inquest is concluded, that pretty much brings things to a, a conclusion in terms of any further evidence that needs to be provided and shared with the family. Um, but I would say from a head of healthcare perspective, um, you never know, you might get contacted by the family of the deceased, um, perhaps a few months later saying, um, at the inquest, you said that this was going to be improved. I'd like an update. And I do think it is worthwhile ensuring that any recommendations or actions that have been implemented are regularly reviewed even after the inquest. That's good advice anyway, because you never know, you might come to being at another inquest with the exact same issues. And wouldn't it be easier to be able to say, well, we've done all this because we did it at this previous inquest that we that we were at and we've already dealt with this problem. Um, so it's definitely worthwhile keeping an eye on those actions and implementations and making sure that um, they remain up to date. I think we might have covers all the questions. I think there might be one more here about the phones. Um, deck phones on the wings can allow healthcare staff to speak directly to the ambulance service call handlers. So that's that's helpful. So it sounds like there are there are some phones on the wings where healthcare can speak to the ambulance service. Um, I'd be interested to know actually whether that's um, available in all prisons, um, or whether that's a relatively new thing. Um, but um, it does seem to be slightly different depending on which prison you are at. And I presume that's down to just, I suppose, the, the, the actual prison estate and how up to date the technology is within the prison. Um, so I think unless anybody has any final questions, I think we might have covered um, the questions on case study one. Uh, just a final comment. So the key information the ambulance service need to know is, um, is the patient breathing and are they conscious? Absolutely. Um, those are the first questions they ask, isn't it? Um, and it's just really important that whoever is talking to the ambulance service, whether it's the prison staff or healthcare staff, that that information is accurately provided to the ambulance service and ideally recorded in the notes as well. So when we come to the inquest, there is absolutely no um, doubt in terms of what information was actually provided to the ambulance service. OK, I think we might have got to the end of the questions, but just a reminder to everybody, um, please do continue put, putting your comments or questions into the comments box and we'll come back to them um, when we take further questions. So.
I will now pass back to Charlie, who will present case study two. Oh, Charlie, Sorry, I think you were on, on mute, you. wasn't I? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, case study two um, is in relation to Ali Shah. So he was an inmate remanded at HMP Box on the 4th of April 2022. He had a history of sus substance misuse, depression and self-harm having been previously monitored in prison under suicide and self-harm prevention procedures, otherwise known as ACT. Upon his arrival at HMP Box, Ali did not receive a healthcare reception review or a first night interview. His vul vulnerabilities assessment was inaccurate and incomplete, and he was not referred to the mental health team as he should have been. Despite his medical records showing Ali was prescribed an antidepressant in the community, this was overlooked by prison healthcare staff. There were several risk factors of suicide and self-harm, but staff did not identify Ali's increased risk and failed to monitor him under ACT. A body scan indicated that he was concealing illicit items internally and he was taken to the prison's segregation unit. Healthcare staff did not assess him in reception due to his abusive behaviour and a nurse completed the segregation health screen assessment without seeing him. Staff used force to restrain Ali on two occasions. Although Ali was extremely abusive to staff, he did not pose a risk of harm which justified the use of force and staff did not use de-escalation techniques. The segregation unit records were inadequate and there was no record of any significant interactions with Ali. On his first night at HMP Box, a nurse checked on Ali on one occasion. Staff did not raise any concerns about his welfare. The following day, prison staff said they suspected Ali was under the influence of drugs Ali was seen three times by a nurse who said officers did not tell her of their suspicions. Prison officers checked Ali roughly every half hour. At around 5.30pm, an officer found Ali hanging in his cell. Nurses and officers tried to resuscitate him. The prison officers did not immediately call a code blue, so there was a 10 minute delay in the control room staff calling for an ambulance. Paramedics arrived and took Ali to hospital, but he died that evening. Post-mortem toxicology results showed that Ali had used a large quantity of a powerful tranquilizer before his death. So I'll now hand over to David, who will be covering the issues in this case. Thanks, Charlotte. Let me just change my screens a sec. OK, so uh, the case of Mr Shah uh, at HMP Box, um, what we've done with this example is use a real case, but we've also thrown in some additional facts and issues that we've seen in a number of other cases that we've dealt with, just to make it a bit more complicated. So we've heard this was a hanging in the SAP queue uh, the day after the prisoner's arrival into custody. Again, with this one, we'll have a look at the issues, the recommendations that were made, some of the action that was taken to improve the service, and then the findings that were made at inquest. So like before, before I go into the central issues from a healthcare perspective, uh, I'm just going to give you all a minute or two, just have a think about what you'd expect to be in focus here. So have a think about factors that might be considered causative. So by that, I mean any act or omission that probably or possibly, because this is Article 2, more than minimally contributed to death. Also, any factors that might not be causative but might cause a coroner some concern around the risk of future deaths. So if you just take a moment um, just to put any thoughts in the comments box and we'll have a think, uh, have a look to see what you all think. Delay in CPR, yeah, absolutely. Line emergency call. Staffing. How I was able to consume the tranquilizer? Yeah, absolutely. Lack of robust analysis of his existing risks. And yeah, so mental health. 
poor communication, yeah, lack of joint working between the prison and healthcare, screening, huge issue, again, communication, assessment without seeing them in person, absolutely. Got another one up here. Comments here about first and second stage reception screenings being completed at the same time. We can, so quite, there's a bit of a wider question there which we can come back to at the end. Yeah, no referral to mental health. Okay. Okay, so thanks everyone um, for your comments. Let's go through um, the key issues on this one. So the central issues here were firstly, the risk of suicide and self-harm was underestimated by staff and the vulnerabilities assessment was not completed in full and other first night assessments didn't take place. Staff didn't identify his increased risk of suicide and self-harm and failed to open an act. Segregation health screen assessment was completed by a nurse without an in-person assessment, so we've had that in the comments. He was extremely abusive to staff when he arrived. Um, the prison staff um, inflamed the situation rather than diffused that force was used, which was not necessary. And then no attempt was made to de-escalate the situation. And so those, those are issues more for the prison service, but from our perspective, he, he wasn't seen by a nurse after the force had been used. Um, segregation unit records were inadequate, no record of any or no evidence of any significant interactions. No evidence that officers told healthcare staff that they suspect he was under the influence. And then the delay in the emergency response. Um, so those are the, the key issues that we've pulled out, but additionally, we also had a number of other issues here, and I think most of them have been picked up in the comments. So we didn't have the reception screening. We didn't have any referral to mental health despite his history of self-harm and only one overnight check was carried out which is likely to be um, not in line with uh, the first night observations policy that was in place okay so let's have a look at the recommendations that were made by the ppo incorporating the clinical review of the care uh, just on this but these are only some of the recommendations that were made because on this case uh, on which this is largely based, the, the real case had around 18 or 19 recommendations in total. So it required a lot of evidence around learning to address potential PFD concerns. So on review and on this one, it was recommended that the head of healthcare ensured that all staff were aware of the responsibility to complete the vulnerabilities assessment fully, including when a prisoner was in the segregation unit. All, rece all reception staff knew the risk factors and triggers for suicide and self-harm, recorded all the known risk factors of a newly arrived prisoner. Staff to not rely solely on what a prisoner says or how they present and start act procedures where appropriate, record the information considered and the reasons for the decision around act procedures. So some defensible decision making there. A reception health screening uh, takes place on a prisoner's first day in custody and that healthcare staff have access to all relevant information. The segregation health screen is completed in the segregation unit within two hours of a prisoner's arrival. After use of force, a member of healthcare staff is always asked to examine a prisoner. Segregated prisoners are managed appropriately in line with the segregation uh, PSO. Segregation paperwork is appropriately completed and records made of any significant interactions. And staff are reminded to be particularly alert to signs of drug taking in prisoners who have been segregated. And then finally, prisoners at risk in the segregation unit receive appropriate DART monitoring and that healthcare staff complete regular rounds in the segregation unit. So in terms of what changes and improvements might address any concerns around future deaths. We have, we're going to illustrate here uh, just a few of the gaps um, because there's so many, we haven't got time to go through them all, that were dealt with by the head of healthcare in this case. So firstly, the reception process. In this case, the head of healthcare confirmed that our new standard operating procedure had been implemented with expectations for both sides, so the prison and healthcare staff, so a joint SOP. A copy of that standard operating procedure was also provided to the coroner, 
So it was annexed, the statement that was prepared by the head of healthcare. And then the head of healthcare also set out in the statement the changes as in practice as per that standard operating procedure, as well as how staff had been made aware of those changes. So evidence and when the SOP was circulated and then discussed at weekly meetings, etc. Um, as an additional measure, daily safety huddles were introduced to review and discuss prisoners from the previous day's reception with the aim of identifying any concerns around risk with a focus on MDT work and so involving the mental health team in those discussions. In this case, the head of healthcare also gave evidence around the digital pair system, which had been implemented after this death, which in some cases allowed risk to be considered prior to the prisoner even arriving in the prison. And where there was evidence of significant risk, that procedures could be started before they've even arrived. The staff had also been provided with specific training around reception screening and we evidenced that that training was undertaken and um, compliance with that training, etc. And then the head of healthcare also gave evidence around the makeup of the team and how uh, there were no resource issues that would, would prevent screening from taking place. The next, the segregation. In terms of the segregation issues, the coroner was assured that the PSO was being followed in the prison with initial screening undertaken within two hours. Head of Healthcare also confirmed that compliance was being monitored by regular audits, we mentioned them before, and provided evidence of, of the recent audits that have been undertaken, as well as the actions arising out of those audits, how they've been dealt with. Um, a checklist for staff had also been created for completion whenever a prisoner was segregated. Training around completing that um, checklist was also provided to staff and evidenced. Um, with this case as well, the first night observations policy wasn't followed, so the policy was circulated to staff to, to increase their awareness and also discussed in uh, weekly meetings. We also had evidence around uh, compliance with the policies and procedures around segregation and how that would be um, audited. Um, so next, ACT, ACT procedures, so the ACT issues. So in terms of these, Again, the head of healthcare confirmed that training had been provided, included around defensible decision making and recording the rationale for not opening an act in the prisoner's records. Guidance on when an act should be opened by healthcare uh, and what must be recorded in the notes had also been circulated around to staff. The head of healthcare also confirmed that the reception screen and templates, which are completed electronically on system one, prompted staff to consider opening an act based on responses received around suicide and self-harm. I think that's. Yeah, so that's a, a brief illustration really of how some of these issues were dealt with, um, but this was a very a complex case, as I mentioned before, which identified a, a number of, of gaps in care. So it required a, a very detailed statement underpinned by an action plan, which had been uh, in, in a work in progress for some time. So we'll move on to the findings now, but in terms of the the PFD concerns here. Uh, ultimately, the coroner was satisfied with the evidence that was provided um, and didn't feel as though they were under a duty to issue any report. So I'll skip through all the findings. So in this case, the jury was satisfied that a number of factors contributed to Mr. Shah's death, as you can see here, um, or conscious that some of you might not be able to see the slides actually, so I'll just read them out. The fact that the scanner revealed he had secreted drugs, the manner in which the control and restraints and the strip search were conducted and a failure to escalate, the absence of any mental health assessment during Ali's arrival and reception and being discovered suspended in his cell, the absence of a medical assessment during Ali's arrival in prison, in reception, sorry, and being discovered suspended in his cell, Ali's use of drugs during the time, his time on the segregation unit, so they were satisfied that all of those factors contributed more than minimally and each presented an opportunity to do something that would have prevented his death. So the key um, factors from healthcare's perspective were C and D, so the absence of any mental health act assessment during his um, arrival and reception, and then the absence of any medical assessment during his arrival and reception and being discovered. So those were the two sort of key um, factors from from our perspective. However, the jury were not satisfied on the evidence that he probably had the intention to take his own life and therefore returned a conclusion of misadventure. 
which is an unintended consequence of an intended act. That completes this case study, so now it's time for any questions on this one. Again, I think people have been using the chat function, but please use it now and put any comments, questions in there. Yeah, so David, um, one question was about the actual medical cause of death in this case. I think it was 1A hanging, wasn't it? It was, it was yeah. hanging, yeah. Yeah. Medical cause of death. I think because this is a is a as a case which is brought in elements of other cases, um, I think in the in the real situation there was no um, evidence of him having the tranquilizer in his um, in his system. Um, so it the medical cause of death might be hanging stills one a, but you might have you know the um, a contribution by the um, the drugs in his system as well. Yeah, I suppose that might come under part two potentially. Yeah, it's a contributory yeah. factor, yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's also a comment um, often find in prison cases there is a failure to get GP and sometimes psychiatric records. Um, that's definitely something I've seen, um, particularly when a prisoner has very recently come into the prison. There is that that delay in getting the um, GP summary from the community potentially and also any psychiatric records that might help in terms of further management. I think definitely in terms of secondary health, so psychiatric records and yeah. things like that, they definitely struggle to get um, those records. But my understanding is that things have improved in terms of getting the, the GP summary record and that pulls through now because um, historically they had access to the spine, but it was only a limited number of prisoners. And mm. I think that's that's been improved over recent years. So they are pulling through the summary records um, quite quickly on their arrival now, which is helping things. Yeah, so there was also um, a question about um, was there a secreted drugs policy or protocol implemented following um, this scenario? I'm guessing there probably was and that that would be more likely to be the governor who'd need to implement that. Would that be right? There was a, sec a secreted um, drugs policy and there was also um, like a, a, a separate sort of procedure in terms of um, monitoring people in segregation who are suspected as, as having um, bit, being under the influence of drugs. So there was sort of specialist sort of procedure there for that to deal with it. And we evidenced that in the statements as well and how staff had been educated on on the requirements as per procedure. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions is, or, or observations is, um, so the coroner was satisfied, but the jury were not. And I suppose what we're getting at there is the coroner was satisfied by the lesson learning evidence that was provided by the head of healthcare, but the jury were obviously concerned about what had actually happened on a factual basis in terms of Ali's care, and therefore yeah. that needs to be reflected in the record of inquest. Yeah, so actually with, with jury inquests, so prison prison deaths are, are, are normally uh, with a jury if it's unnatural, known, etc. Evidence around changes and improvements is heard in the absence of the jury, so it's not a matter for the jury to determine whether a PFD should be issued. It's solely the responsibility of the coroner to consider whether they're under a duty to issue that report. So you'll find that the factual evidence will be heard and then at the end of the inquest, the jury will be sent out and you'll have the head of healthcare given evidence around changes and improvements. And that can also evolve as the as sort of the, as we hear the facts of the evidence throughout the inquest, because the head of healthcare will prepare a very detailed statement dealing with X, Y, Z, but actually the key issues might only come out in the evidence during that week or two weeks, when however long it, it, it goes on for. So that's why it's really important for the head of healthcare to be there if possible throughout the whole um, inquest so that they're aware of what's sort of becoming central um, throughout it. Absolutely. Um, one observation about cultural biases were any identified in this case. So I suppose um, I have had a few inquests where cultural biases have been an issue and also simply a lack of understanding or appreciation, particularly when you have a prisoner who um, English is their second language or, you know, cultural um, um, sensitivities. Um, is, is that something that you've seen, David, in any inquests that you've come across? Is that something that sometimes something comes up? No, it's not something that I've had any experience of, and I think, yeah, yeah, 
yeah um, um it, it wasn't in in this case we've we've changed the yeah name, we've so changed that's the what's name. maybe confused yeah. things but yeah. um but yeah in this case there was there was no issues from in terms of that yeah yeah that's something that um i've seen in a couple of cases i have dealt with um which is it's mainly been down to a lack of um understanding of the prisoner um perhaps if they're demonstrating that they're in pain um healthcare staff just simply haven't haven't understood um how the prisoner's feeling um mm, good question then yeah so in terms of um yeah, we've, we've got a comment here about some prisons have different medical systems. Um, I think that's right, isn't it? Obviously, we're we're basing our scenarios on the system one um, medical record system. But I think there are still some prisons out there who use different systems. And and I think I think some still have paper um, records. Yeah, I think the idea is like the clues in the name, isn't it? System one just have for everyone to be on the one system, but I'm not sure. Yeah. That, prisons that we deal with the majority if not all of them have system one yeah um i'm not sure if you've had any experience of different systems lizzie or no I've, paper I've, records yeah <laughs> i've i've not personally thank goodness because paper records can be um a challenge um i've had a number of inquests though where perhaps you have um other services who are contracted out so maybe that substance misuse mm. or drug and re rehabilitation and such like um and those organizations might have that their, their own set of records um coroners always like it ideally if everybody's just on system one or on the main medical record system um so i have had a few inquests where that's been a learning point for the head of healthcare to see if there's any way that those subtracted, um, subcontracted organisations can have access to System 1 to be able to see the full medical record and also add in any notes that they have to, yeah, to include. That's definitely been an issue that comes up quite a lot, doesn't it? And um, yeah. someone's just pointed out mental health in particular of, of quite a lot of mental health service providers within the prisons do have different systems that they use, but my understanding is that they can also enter on System 1 and most cases um yeah and then the non-clinical dart providers sometimes use different system which can cause difficulties where there's issues from a non-clinical dart perspective of the inquest yeah definitely um and we've got a comment here so if gp and prison healthcare are both on system one they'll be able to essentially see each other's records um I'm going to be honest, David, I'm not entirely sure um, how that works, but it, it's right, isn't it, that GPs in the communities, I think a lot of them are on system one now, um, but I don't believe those records necessarily pull through to the system one record that will be available at the prison. I think there's still a need to go and get the GP summary record. I think that's my current understanding, but it might be different in different prisons. Yeah, I'm not sure if if the prison have access to the GP records sort of as the uh, they can access what's already there when he's transferred in mm. but then sort of as it as it goes along I'm not sure if they continue to have that access or whether it's I know it's on the same system or whether they continue can continually see that where there's going on the GP record I'm not sure yeah it sounds like it is a bit inconsistent anyway because um We've got a comment which says only if GP to GP GMS registered. So I suspect the there's not going to be every GP um, on the same system. No. Um, I think yeah. access is improving, but it's still not 100% there yet. This yeah understanding of it, but hopefully it will improve, yeah. continue to improve. I think in an ideal world, everything will be on on one medical record yeah, system. system but yeah, ah, wishful thinking. Um, <laughs> Before we wrap things up, actually, um, I've had a little look at the coroner statistics um, further to a question that was asked about um, data. Um, so the coroner statistics that we have are actually from 2021 and they came out last year. We don't have the figures for 2022 yet, but basically those figures said that there were 373 deaths in prison. This is the highest level since reporting began in terms of the coroner statistics reporting. 
which began in 2011, and it's an increase of 17% compared to 2020. Now, the only problem with this figure is this is from 2021. So it's during the pandemic, you know, it's it's all the COVID-19 um, uh, period of time. Um, and the, it's fair to say the the figures aren't entirely consistent in terms of what data is available. So we do also have the Ministry of Justice quarterly safety and custody statistics. Um, all of this is available on, I think it's the, um, the government website. Um, and we've got statistics in the 12 months to December of 2022, so last year. That said that there were 301 deaths in prison custody, which is a decrease of 19% from 371 deaths in the previous 12 months. Of these deaths, 74 deaths were self-inflicted, which is a 16% decrease from the 88 self-inflicted deaths in the previous 12 months. So it's fair to say it's a slightly unclear picture. And I think we probably need to wait to see the 2022 figures for deaths in prison custody, because I, th I would have thought by then any sort of um, skewed figures that might have resulted from the pandemic might have made their way through in terms of the coroner statistics. Um, but if anybody else has got any um, interesting statistics on this particular point, I know I'd be interested to learn about them. Um, and I know that we had a suggestion earlier to um, look at, um, I think it was the Prison Reform Trust, I think they've got some statistics as well. So I'm just going to check that we don't have any final questions or observations that come through. Let me just see. Yes, yeah, so we've got a comment which says the two main GP electronic patient records are System 1 and EMIS, um, but others are in use. Organisations can both have access to same systems, but not to view the records of the other provider. Um, basic data, diagnosis, allergies, etc., is accessible for all via the NHS spine, and yeah, I, I think that that's generally what what is available on System One um, at the prison. But in terms of looking behind that and whether there's any further information about any ongoing um, investigations that are taking place, that's where it's useful to get more details from the GP. And I think, I think that's all the questions. So yeah, and we've only gone over by three minutes. So I'm quite <laughs> proud of us. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for everyone um, for coming today. I hope you found it interesting. Um, I believe uh, Lorraine has put in the chat um, the link to the feedback survey. So please do fill that in um, if you have time. We will be doing a further um, webinar in due course. Um, but obviously, we're really happy to hear from you guys about what topics you want us to cover. It's it's all about you. We want to know what it is that you want us to um, to present on. Um, but our next webinar, we are hoping to get an actual coroner to come to the webinar and just explain a little bit more about what it what is it from a coroner's perspective that they like to see um, in terms of giving evidence at death in prison custody inquests. So I think we'll wrap things up. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.